this on last week, but doxa means what? It means glory, and logo means to speak, to speak of the glory of the Lord. That's what we just sang when we sang the doxology. We sang the glory of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 122 is where we're going to be today, and I've entitled the message, In the House. And the, the biblical truth this morning is, where Christians gather, we are the house of the Lord. Where Christians gather, we are the house of the Lord. Not the building itself, but the people. The people become the dwelling place of God. So as you're finding your way uh, to Psalm 122, if you're having trouble there, just kind of open up your Bible directly to the center, and you're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of Psalm 122. So go ahead and, and find that there. This is one of 15 songs of ascent. So if you look at the title there of the psalm, it says, A Song of Ascents of David. And it's one of only four songs of ascents that was attributed to David or to David. Now, when we say four, and the titles aren't real clear here, the Hebrew can mean that it's written about David or it was written by David. Most scholars say probably written by David. But considering that, though, David never saw the temple... Uh, that was built, but he made the preparations for the temple. So when he talks about the house of the Lord, he could be talking about the tabernacle because David brought the tabernacle to the threshing floor of Arana, which is where the temple mount would be later. And he had never made the pilgrimage himself since his home was as the king of Israel in Jerusalem. David wrote the psalm for his posterity and those who would travel and pilgrimage from all over Israel and come up to Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, and bring their offerings to the Lord during those holy feasts of Israel. And in this psalm, David demonstrates his passion for being in the place of worship, his passion for the people of God. David believed that Jerusalem was important because it was the center of worship. It was the center of worship. David believed that Jerusalem was important because it was the seat of government as well. The holy city of Jerusalem is mentioned 810 times in Scripture. It is the central city of Scripture. It is the center of the world in many minds. And what we refer to as heaven, our permanent home, is named the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 2 and verse 10. And so as we think about Jerusalem, as David writes this psalm, I want us to be thinking about how important Jerusalem is for us as believers. Why don't you stand with me and we'll read the entire psalm. It's not very long. So Psalm 122, and we're going to read it all together. You follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read. A song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Let us pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for your word today. We're thankful for the holy city of Jerusalem. And Lord, how that place represents for us the presence of Almighty God. And Lord, as we approach that place this morning in our hearts, we pray that we would come with the right attitude and the right hearts that we would come with clean hands and a pure heart, and we would not uh, lift up our soul to what is evil or false, but, Father, we would seek what is good, and we would do your will 
Lord, as we come before this psalm and we uh, are revealed before it, our hearts are revealed before it, Lord, whatever is not of you, may you remove it. And whatever needs to be in our hearts that's not, not there, Lord, that you would place it there. Put a fervor in our hearts for your presence. Put a desire to be with you, just as our, our ancestor David did. And Lord, that you would bless your people. And Father, that you would keep us and that we would be a light to those around us who don't know you. Lord, if there's one here today, they've drawn near to this place, but their heart is far from you. Will you draw them close today? And if they don't know you in their heart, Lord, would you save them today? We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated. What I want to tell you this morning is your attitude in worship reflects your relationship with Christ. It reflects your relationship with Christ. So how you came to this place, your attitude while you're here, it reflects your relationship with Christ. And if you truly have a saving relationship with Christ Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then these things will be true of you that were true of David. Number one, you will come joyful. How do you feel this morning? How are you feeling? You feel pretty good? Some of you got some pain, not feeling too great, got a little bit of a cough. Alistair Begg said, don't ask me how I feel, ask me what I know. And that's true for David as well. You could ask David how he felt on one day, and it wouldn't be very good. You ask him how he felt on another day, it'd be great. And for the majority of us, how we feel on a Sunday morning is pretty miserable most of the time, right? We have to get up early. We'd rather sleep in. We have to get all this fixed and make it presentable, and it takes a lot of time, and we rush in through the doors, and we're dragging kids with us, and we forget something. We have to turn around, go back home, and pick it up before we can get there. We're late. We're grumpy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, that's the way it is in reality for us. So the question is not how do you feel? The question is what do you know? And if you know that your God is a good God, He's a loving God, He's a saving God, He's the God of all comfort, He's the God of all peace, He's the God of of your existence, when you come into His house, you can come joyful. Joy, Joy doesn't depend on the circumstances, and it certainly doesn't depend on our feelings. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is a reality. It's a disposition. And I wonder, is that true of you? Do you come that way? And if you truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you'll come the way David came to the house of worship. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. David was glad because of the people gathered there. Notice what he says. He mentions a personal desire when he says, I. I was glad. It's personal for him. But then David not only mentions that personal desire, he mentions communal devotion. When they said to me, let us. Notice there's community there. And David was excited about going to be in the presence of Almighty God. But David was also excited about the people that were gathered there. I wonder how you feel. Do Do you hold on to those two things? Are you glad because of the people that will be gathered in the house of worship? Are you glad because of the presence of God that's there? I just want you to think about those two things. G. Campbell Morgan said, That house, referring to either the temple that was later to be built or even the tabernacle that existed in David's day, that house was supreme in importance because it was the house of Jehovah. Jehovah, the God of grace, is the one around whom the people gather. Caleb, you going to keep up with me? G. Campbell Morgan. There are far too many people today who do not know the gladness and joy that David spoke of in Psalms 122. If you don't go to the house of the Lord at all, that's a sad thing for you. You're missing the blessing in the presence of God among the people of God. And you can't get that through watching a TV screen. 
Now, I understand, understand how vital our online ministry is for those away who are sick uh, or can't make it. But we should have an enthusiastic desire. And, and I know those folks. We see those folks. We visit those folks that can't make it here, and they would love to be here. I can't tell you how many people I visit that say, I just wish, I watch it online, but I just wish I could be there. And they have that enthusiastic desire to be here. I wonder, do you have that? Do you have that inner burning, that inner desire to gather with the people of God? And it doesn't imply, whenever David said that I was glad when they said to me, it does not imply that everything that happens in the house of the Lord is entertaining. Even in David's day, there was things that happened in the house of the Lord that most people would turn their faces away from and not look at. They wouldn't enjoy it at all. So we have to guard against the idea that everything in church is about making us comfortable and everything about church should be entertaining and, and therefore make entertainment our idol. And we can't do that. But on the other hand, whenever Christ Jesus is the center, at the center of your heart and to the center of your worship, you will come to the house of the Lord joyful. But not only will you come joyful, You'll also come thankful. Look at what it says in verses 3 through 4. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. You hear that part? To give what? To give thanks to the name of the Lord. So when we come to worship, when we come to the house of God and in the house of God, there should be thanksgiving. It should be a thankful thing for us to come and worship the Lord. Not begrudging what we have to do. I have to go to church today. Got to get up. It's church day. And I remember whenever I was younger, I felt like that on occasion. Because I'd rather be doing something else. But now I realize the depth of my sin and the debt that I owed that was paid for me. And what it causes is thanksgiving to well up in my heart. Israel went up to the Temple Mount three times a year prescribed by the Torah. Now, David mentions that. It says, as was decreed for Israel in verse 4. Well, those three, those three feasts that were decreed were the three feasts of Passover, which happened in the springtime, and it coincides with the celebration of Christ's passion and the resurrection. And it commemorates the liberation of the people from the bondage of Egypt. So spiritually, we remember in that, uh, during that time the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how it gives us new life. And then also the Pentecost uh, or the, the Feast of First Fruits, Shavuot, 50 days after Passover, the birthday of the church. We remember and give thanks for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We pray for revival. And we thank God that He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us during that time period. And so you see how two out of three so far all point to Jesus. Those feasts point to Jesus. And it was time for Thanksgiving. But then the last one, Tabernacles, which is the time of the year where we are right now, after the fall harvest. A time to remember the wilderness wanderings giving thanks for His promise and His provision. And remember, our dwelling here on this earth is temporary, but our heavenly home is permanent. Amen. That's what Tabernacles is all about. That's what this time of the year is about. And we're going we're gonna to have Thanksgiving in just a couple of weeks, aren't we? When you come to the house of the Lord, though, it's time to give thanks every time you come through those doors. It's also time to give thanks every time you go out. As you come and you go. In, in the book of Ezra, we, we read about this time period in the nation of Israel where they haven't been able to come to worship. Now you just imagine if for a period of, I don't know, 40 years, we weren't allowed to come to church. And how difficult that would be. What would it be like if, if, that, if the Christians all came together at the end of that period of time? And were able to come in and worship. Listen to what it says. They sang responsively 
praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good. Therefore, his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel and all the people shouted with a great shout and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Listen, they didn't even have walls up yet. And guess what they were doing? They were having revival. When we think about Jerusalem, David said, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. And it's a picture of the unity of God's people. And it's a picture of the people in the hands of the Lord. And how Jerusalem now, when it, before in former times, it, it was not a place to be worshipped or thought of as, as, as a place to, of worship. But now because it's in the hands of the Lord, It's the most holy city. And it's the place of worship. William Plummer said this, It matters not how wicked or degraded a place may have been in former times. When it is sanctified to the use and service of God, it becomes honorable. Jerusalem was formerly Jebus, a place where the Jebusites committed their abominations and where... uh, were the miseries of those who hastened after another God. But now, since it is devoted to God's service, it is a city compact together, the joy of the whole earth. And that's a picture of what it's like for you and me. Whenever we repent of our sin and we put our faith in Jesus now, what was formerly in the hands of Satan, which was useless for God's kingdom, now it becomes useful for God. You and me. And we ought to be thankful about that as a, a good old boy that, that kind of spoke to this. I saw his video on YouTube and I thought it'd be, he, he did a better job of saying this as I, than I could. So I said, I'll let you listen to him. Hey, we'll play that video. Good morning, y'all. Have you ever had somebody send you something that was just too good not to share, but maybe a little too much to type? Well, my dad sent me something the other day and I thought it was awesome. So I was just going to share it with you. If you take this basketball right here, You put it in my hands, yeah, it's worth about 15 bucks. That's it. But you put that basketball in the hands of LeBron James, it's worth about 30 or 40 million. You take this football right here, you put it in my hands, it's worth about, I don't know, 10, 11 dollars, probably. You put it in the hands of Peyton Manning, it's worth about 50, 60 million dollars. Depends on whose hands it is. You take this golf club right here, you put it in my hands, Ah, it might be worth 50 bucks, maybe. You put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, though, it's worth 80 million. You see, it depends on whose hands it in. If I have a stick in my hand, a rod in my hand, I might could beat away an animal or a wild animal or something trying to come at me. But you put it in the hands of Moses and it part of the Red Sea. You put a slingshot in my hands. It just becomes a kid's toy. You put it in the hands of King David, and he slays the giant with it. See, it depends on whose hand it is in. And, you know, two fishes and five loaves of bread would feed me with some bread left over. You put it in the hands of Jesus, and it feeds thousands. Depends on whose hands that it's in. If I had a couple of nails in my hand right now, I might would build you a birdhouse, if you're lucky. Might nail down a piece of wood. But you put them same nails in Jesus' hands, and it leads to salvation and eternal life for folks who love him and folks who trust him. You see, it depends on whose hands that it's in. And your worries and your cares and the things that's got you stressed out, if you leave them in your hands, that's all they're ever going to be. But if you put them same worries and cares and your problems in the hands of Christ, he's going to see you through it. He's going to take care of every need that we got. Y'all take care and have a blessed day. But just remember, it depends on whose hands that it's in. Give everything you've got to God and let him handle it for you. Take care. We love you all. Amen. So the question that we have for you this morning is, have you put your life in the hands of Jesus? And if you truly have put your life in the hands of Jesus and you know that he has saved you and is sanctifying you, that's worth giving thanks about. And so... The the nation of Israel, they came up three times a year. All of the males came up three times a year, and they gave thanks to the name of the Lord. So come joyful 
you will come joyful if you know the Lord and come thankful if you really truly know the Lord in your heart. But thirdly, we should come humble if we know the Lord in our heart. Now look at verse 5 with me. And, and when I first read the, the passage and began to prepare, I thought, well, what am I going to do with verse 5? And as I, the more I studied, it became the central verse of the entire psalm. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. You think, well, how is that the center of all of this? Well, it's at the center of the psalm because it is the center of the psalm. And it reminds us of a couple of other passages. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You see, as we come into this place, what we're doing is we're exposing ourselves to the presence of God in a real way. We're bringing ourselves near to Him. And whenever that happens, there's something else that happens. God's Spirit begins to look within us and begins to look deeply within our hearts as we come before Him. Now, it's similar to what happened in David's day when the people would come and David ruled from Jerusalem as well as the other kings that followed him. And he made judgments from the throne. And the Lord said to David, in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The question I have, did David live forever and sit on the throne? No. David died and was buried in the land of Israel. His bones were put in the ground. So to whom does the Lord refer whenever he says that he will sit on the throne forever? Forever and ever. Well, Jesus was the son of David who is seated upon the throne right now. He is the judge of everything. He alone is. He is the judge of everything that's happening right now in this place. He's the judge of everything that's happening in the nation of Israel right now. And he will be on the throne when it's all over, when it's all said and done, and he will judge you and me ultimately. We owe everything to Christ. And because Christ descended from David, we owe everything to the Jewish people. Now, Paul says in Romans chapter 11, if some of the branches were broken off, meaning some of the Jews didn't believe in Christ, and you, although a wild olive shoot, meaning Gentiles, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Who's the olive tree? We're in church. Who, who's that? Jesus. Jesus is the olive tree. Do not be arrogant, he says, toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. If Jesus is uh, the shoot from the root of Jesse, which is Israel, then that means that all of us owe everything, to, not just to Jesus, but to the nation of Israel for our faith in Christ. And what that means for us, and, and this is where we really need to hit home with some of us today, maybe, and, and I, I don't know if it's true of you, but it could possibly be true in the in the place that we live, in the time that we live, any anti-Semitism and bigotry toward Israel has absolutely no place in the church. And it will not be tolerated in our congregation. Our hearts should hurt for the senseless loss of life and the atrocious acts perpetrated by the enemies of Israel. And the Lord looks upon that with judgment. And all throughout Scripture, I could take you to passage after passage after passage that says that the Lord will never forsake Israel, that He will deal with the enemies of Israel for His name's sake. I, uh, I wrote down the words of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his phone call conversation that he had with the President of the United States, Joe Biden. 
And this is what he said. He said, Joe, I want to give you a clear picture of the difficult situation we face. We were struck Saturday by an attack whose savagery we have not seen since the Holocaust. We've had hundreds massacred, families wiped out in their beds and their homes, women brutally raped and murdered, over 100 kidnapped, including children. And since we last spoke, the extent of this evil, it's only gotten worse. They took dozens of children, bound them up, burned them, and executed them. They beheaded soldiers. They mowed down these youngsters who came to a nature festival and just, and just put five jeeps around a depression in the soil. And like Babi R, they mowed them down, making sure they killed everybody. We've never seen such savagery in the history of the state, he said. They're even worse than ISIS, and we need to treat them as such. And what you're about to see is justice rolled down like waters from Jerusalem upon her enemies. And when we see what's happening in, the, in Israel right now, it might look like evil is winning. Innocent lives are taken. But don't you doubt for a moment that Christ sees what's happening. And that He is seated on the throne. Not in Jerusalem, but in heaven. And He will return in glory. He will place His feet on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and the mountain will split one day. He will take his seat at the temple mount, and he will judge the nations from the great white throne. And that's what's going to happen soon and very soon. And as you gathered in this place this morning, did you come humble before the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Because the scripture says that one day every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you haven't come that way this morning, you've never done that before. In just a few moments, we will invite you to do that. To humble your heart before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And to ask Jesus to be your Savior. If He's your Savior, on that day He will not be your judge. But if He's not your Savior, on that day He will be your judge. And so as we come... If we know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we'll come joyful, we'll come thankful, we'll come humble, but lastly, we'll come prayerful because we know that every good thing, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights who is in heaven. So look at verses 6 through 9. So the Scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command that we would pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And as David writes the psalm, he's speaking specifically of, once again, the gathering of God's people and the place where the presence of the glory of God dwelled. And so if that's true that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, it means that we should pray for the peace of Myrtle Grove Baptist Church as well. Because it's the place where the people gather and the glory of God is manifest. His presence is known. And so as we pray, we should pray for one another. And so we pray with compulsion to pray because we're commanded to pray. And we pray with confidence, secondly, to be secure and at peace. Notice those words that are used there in the psalm. That it would be secure and it would be peace. God grants security and peace. There's no other source. Did you hear me say that? There's no other source of security and peace. And we think that ADT is the one that keeps us safe at night. Or whichever one you have. We have Vivian at our house. There is no other source of security and peace than Almighty God. It doesn't come from anywhere else. So right now as we sit in this place, I stand, you sit. By the way, I want you to think about that. I have to stand up for... You say, man, he's preaching a long time. I'm thinking, yeah, I am preaching a long time. I've been standing for 45 minutes. As we dwell securely in this place, we are enjoying the peace and security that only the Lord gives. And we have to remember that any moment that could be taken away. So we pray for the peace of the gathering of the people of God. 
And then we pray for concern. Notice what else he says. For my brothers and my companions sake, I will say, peace be within you. The word peace there is the word shalom, which is the standard greeting that every Israelite would give to one another. They would say shalom. And what shalom really means is this inner peace that that can't be taken away. It's not tranquility and it's not uh, being alone. But it's being together with the people of God and there being no animosity between us and no inner turmoil within us. So we pray with that kind of concern for the well-being of the people around you. Do you pray for the people next to you when we pray? Do you think about the needs of the church whenever we gather together and who is sick and who is out and who should be here and who's not and all of those things? Do you concern yourself with prayer? We should pray with concern. And fourthly, we should pray with consistency. Look what it says lastly. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. That word seek means to to desire it, to go for it, to go after it, to want it, to make it come to be. I'm asking the Lord for the good of the house of the Lord. Not just a passing prayer either. A lifelong prayer. Not trying to get too political here, but I just got to say that the U.S. looks weak to our enemies. You know, the U.S. has given more than $6 billion to Iran recently. <laughs> like, whose side are we on? The top funders of Hamas. And our enemies perceive our weakness. They're recognizing their opportunity to gain new territory and mobilizing to exploit our weaknesses in leadership. Reagan said, peace through strength. Do you remember that? And he said the best way to prevent war is to be able to decisively win any war, to have that ability. And the only reason I mention all of that is not just because of the the climate, the world climate that we see around us and the political climate in America, but here's the thing. It's the same in the spiritual realm as it is in the political realm. When we neglect prayer, we look weak to our spiritual enemy. For Christians, we know that the greatest weapon that we have against the enemies of God is prayer. And if we neglect our prayers, and we turn aside, and we have other things to do, the enemy will exploit that weakness. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. And this is not just personal prayer, but corporate prayer. Because Jesus says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And then he says in verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. We live in a time and a place where evil men are standing at the door trying to not only prevent the gathering of God's people. And listen, I'll tell you this. They come for Israel and they want to wipe Israel off the map. They want to get rid of all, extinguish all of the the Israeli people, the Jewish people. Don't think for a moment that they don't have their sights set on the Christians as well. Satan would love for you to just stay at home. Not join with the people of God. Or if you get drugged to church, at least be here physically, but your mind be somewhere else. And your heart be somewhere else. Satan hates the house. And you know what Jesus said about the house? He said that my house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. A house of prayer for the nations. The gathering of God's people. I don't know what the future holds for Israel, the immediate future holds for Israel. I know what it says is going to happen in the end. God will vindicate his people. And I believe that's coming soon and very soon. I think we're seeing the timeline of events wind down toward the end. I think that's what's happening. Could go on for another thousand years. I don't know. 
But what I believe in my heart and what I, what I know in my heart is this. If you're not ready for the return of Christ, it's coming sooner than you think. Either you'll pass away and you'll stand before Him in judgment very soon. Or the Lord will return and you'll stand before Him in judgment. So as you bow your heads and you close your eyes, the invitation is for you this morning that if you don't know Christ, come to Him now. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one who lived the sinless life here on this earth. And he died on a sinner's cross. He defeated sin and death. He arose again on the third day. And he's alive. And he's returning. And so your response to him, if you recognize that you are a sinner and you need his forgiveness, then you just turn from your sin and put your faith in him to save you. That's all it takes. There's nothing magical about a prayer or walking an aisle or being baptized that saves you. It's simply your faith, your childlike faith in Christ. So with your head bowed, your eyes closed, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Inviting Jesus into your heart to take the throne of your heart, be Lord over your life, forgive you of your sin. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus... I admit to you that I am a sinner. I've done things that I know are wrong and I've failed to do the things that I know are right. And Jesus, I deserve the penalty for my sin. But Jesus, I believe that you lived a sinless life, the life that I could never live. And Jesus, you gave your life on the cross to forgive me and set me free. So Jesus, I, I turn from my sin. I ask you to forgive me a sinner and I give you my life right now. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Give me a home in heaven with you and give me your spirit here on this earth that I might live for you. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Now would you stand with me? If you prayed that prayer, and you meant it with all your heart, that's not something to keep in. That's something to be shared. So if you've prayed that prayer this morning, this is your invitation to come and share what the Lord Jesus has done for you. He heard your prayer. He's made you a new person. He's put His Spirit within you. This church loves you. We want to welcome you into the family of faith. We have resources for you. We want to offer you believers baptism. We'll let you be a part of a small group Sunday school so you can grow in your faith and your knowledge of Jesus. So you come. This is your invitation. If you need to just simply have someone pray for you and with you, you come. We'll have our altar counselors right here at the front and you come and join them in prayer. They'll be glad to pray with you and for you for whatever needs you may have. And if you know that the Lord Jesus is calling you to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church to be a member here, then you come. This is your invitation as well. Let's sing together.